Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Carl. And you're listening to Secret Sonics. Honest conversations chock full of tactical advice to help you build your dream career in music and audio. Whether it's skill development, mixing mindsets, personal branding, or work-life balance, we talk about ways to help set yourself up for success in the ever-changing music industry. Let's get started. Hi, Ben. Hi, Carl. (laughs) Are we going to try to stop laughing? No. Is that going to happen? It's never happened. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I'm I'm trying to stop. It's just, I I just love- It's too silly. I just love seeing your face, you know? And there's, there's a level of like- just genuinely enjoying being with somebody. And then there's another level when you're just both equally goobers in a moment. You know, there's something special about that. And I love how we get to share that every week. Yeah. It's really like letting go and just feeling like ourselves and in front of one another. Yeah. Yeah. I would love it. This is good. Going good, I guess, for 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 new co- co-hosts on a podcast. Yeah. You don't hate me yet. That's good. No, not yet. <laughs> Plenty of time. Plenty of time. Well, so Carl, today we were going to talk about defining success for ourselves. Oh, yes. We're defining success, generally speaking, in the music industry, as audio engineers, as mixers. This is something that I think about a lot. I imagine you're thinking about a lot, because we could be spending our time doing a lot of things, yet we spend our time doing the things that we're doing in audio. Should we walk through like a journey of where we are now, or should we start with where we are now and maybe different places we were in the past or maybe different places we might be in the future? That's a that's a big question. I think the reason behind that question is the fact that you and I both have had varying perceptions of what success meant, various definitions of what success means to us, you know, and that has evolved over time. So I think, yeah, maybe starting back, back to the first times that we remember having a perception of what success meant and maybe, you know, start as in childhood and then maybe like high school, college, after college, after kids, you know, yeah. ping pong it back and forth maybe. I think my first uh, definition of success was probably at some point between high school and beginning of college of just like wanting to do music as much as possible. So if I was in a band and I was making music, then that was successful. If I was getting to play bass, you know, when you have like the, I don't know, I've had like depress, depressive thoughts. Not that I've, I haven't really struggled with depression, but like, you know, in, in when you're a teenager and you're filled with like lots of feelings and uh, hormones and all kinds of things, you know, and, and sometimes you just think, oh, life is so terrible. I always would think, at least I have music, you know, and music was always this like source of, of light and uh, inspiration. So I think I always told myself, like, as long as I have music, I'll be all right, you know? And so just doing music at one point, I guess, early on was successful for me. That would probably be the first stage, you know, as I'm getting obsessed with music, as I'm learning to play bass, as I'm getting into bands and stuff. You know, that's that's awesome. I'm jealous of that, actually, because I think my, my first perception of what success meant, I think, was being famous. Really? It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily that, you know, something that I sought out. It wasn't like being successful for me meant being famous, but I think, you know, this would be early to mid nineties. I grew up in a small town where there were no, you know, musicians or the arts or really of, of of any sort. Like it just, there was no music scene, no art scene. I mean, we had probably more cows than people, you know, where, where I grew up. (laughs) So are the only music like outside of school concert band stuff that I was even aware of is I knew that there was one bar in the town and the weekend sometimes they had like cover bands like I never went to go I mean I was in middle school I didn't like go to the bar to see cover bands I just I just knew that that was a thing but that to me that was like the limit I think it was either you play at a local bar or you are you know doing the Super Bowl halftime show and there, there. I, I didn't have any perception of like anything in between. I had no idea what the actual industry was like. I didn't realize. Oh, you know, audio is a a thing. You know, I, I just yeah. didn't I didn't clock that. So, no. so I thought really it was either going to be being famous in like a, a rock band or playing in a major symphony orchestra or something like that. Like that that was what i thought success meant and neither of them 
really felt like something that I wanted. Hmm. And I think that was where I struggled. I didn't, what I thought success meant in the industry, my very, 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 very minimal, you know, obscured view of it, uh, that it didn't really call to me. And I think that's why I, it took me a while to really start pursuing music more seriously uh, because I just didn't think that there were any paths. I just didn't know mm. they existed. I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, like when you when you all you see are like the you know the heavy hitters, or the you know the local dive bar or whatever. That 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 seems super intimidating to try to like get to the upper echelon of the music business. I mean, I, I have you know memories of like watching like that Led Zeppelin DVD that came out when I was in high school and being like, I just want to be those guys, you know, like on the stage rocking out, you know. Yeah, for for me it was the Incubus. Uh, I think it was Morning View Sessions. I forget what it was, but there was a DVD that came out that was like a live, live with, like in a small like room with an audience kind kind of thing. And I just remember Ooh, being like, "Oh, like Snarky Puppy before Snarky Puppy kind of thing." Yes, I th yes, like that kind of that kind of vibe. Yeah, and and like that that was the first time I was like, okay, maybe there's an in between. But even then, Incubus at the time was huge, so yeah, humongous. Yeah, they were, they were humongous, fungus among us. Um, that was bad. If you if you know Incubus, <laughs> that was really. If you don't know Incubus, that was bad. If you do know Incubus, that was really really bad. Um, <laughs> but basically, there was you you had like this picture of success when you were like a teenager that was just like strat stratospheric, that was just like basically unattainable except for a select few, and you basically were inhibited by to try to pursue music because that just seemed unattainable to you. Yeah, it didn't seem insurmountable. It just seemed like not a thing, you right. know, like not even a, a rational option. I, I had a moment that was similar to that when we were like checking out colleges and stuff. And so I was in New York and um, I remember I went to Juilliard, like the open house at Juilliard. I went with my dad and I was just like, there's actually like no way I'm actually going to get into Juilliard. And then like, if I do, then I'm going to be playing, you know, upright bass jazz, which I'm going to have to really like struggle to learn and like, it's not even like the music that I'm, I'm passionate about and just being like, just super impressed with it, but also super intimidated by it. And just kind of like, kind of realizing this is not going to be my path. That kind of like upper echelon of, of classical and jazz music. You know what I mean? I just kind of like, I had a glimpse at it and I said like, this is just not going to happen, you know? So like, I, I, I get what you're going, what you're, what you're going for. On the other hand, like I also grew up, you know, in a city and, you know, I saw small venues with bands performing in like high school. You know what I mean? Like I saw those things in Manhattan and also like in like the local Jewish scene, like sort of like Jewish bands that, you know, so I was, that kind of allowed me to even play on stage and like kind of get a feeling for that of just like wanting to be on stage and how fun that was to kind of perform in front of an audience. So it was like a totally different experience, you know, being a city, a city boy. <laughs> yeah. I, Cause I mean, my, so like my graduating class, it was a public school and the district was like a 10 mile radius, like around where the school was. And I had 96 students in my graduating class. So like very large area, just no people. I think, I think the actual town. And this is before like the internet yeah, was yeah. the way it is now. Oh yeah. 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 Cause I graduated high school in 2003. So like we had the internet, but it, it wasn't the internet. Yeah, the AOL we, dial yeah. up. I had AIM, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't what it is now. <laughs> it, it is so weird thinking too, like the, I, I was, I don't think I even went to New York city until I was probably my first time in New York, or even in like a big city was probably in the middle of college, like going there to play a gig, you know, wow. it, it was very rural, very, very, very small town, but like most small towns would look at my hometown and be like, wow, that's a, a parking lot with a, a couple houses around it. Like that's all that really is. So yeah, so, so I, it's, con yeah, contextually, I just, like I said, I just had no, no, no idea what I could do. Not even no idea what, what I could do, but just uh, being a producer, like I didn't even know that producers were a thing. You know, that's how out of touch with reality I was. But when I think when I got to college and I started seeing, okay, well, there are other options. I don't really know what I want to do. And I think, being a session musician was the first thing that I saw as an attainable 
path that I felt like I could do, or it was, it, it was, I could try, you know, I think that was the thing is before there were no, attain, there were no paths that I felt like I could even try. Like, not that I would fail at it. I just didn't even, wouldn't even know where to start with college and really wanting to become a session player. That was the first time where I thought, okay, if I can do that for a living, that's going to be success for me. If I can find a way to just play drums so that I don't have to have a day job, that's success. You know, it, it wasn't even a, a financial goal. It was literally just, am I making music? Yes or no. Am I having to make money doing things besides music? Yes or no. And like the answer to the, mm -hmm. those two questions would let me know if I'm successful or not. Amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, I think at, at, by the time you're in college and I'm in college, our, our, our goals seem to, to collide, you know, in terms of just like, am I doing music? Yes or no. You know, and that's kind of like the, the barometer of, of feeling successful. And, uh, yeah. And when I wasn't doing music, I, you know, things were not as, as good for me, you know, like there was like a, you know, when, when music was less of part of my life then I definitely felt like not as much myself, not my full, not like I was attaining my, the best version of myself. Like, like after moving to Israel and in in different periods of of not doing music, I think I felt like I just needed to get out and do music. And only when I was doing music did I feel more accomplished. You know. Okay, here's a question: When when did you know that you were going to be moving to Israel? Like at what age? So I moved here at age 22, right after college. And during college, I knew I was going to be moving here. I did college in the states, and then I moved here. So so I guess your perception of what success meant was always through the, the like this, the filter, I guess, of knowing like, this is where I'm going to be after I graduate. It wasn't like you, you were going to be yeah. planning on being in the States. And then, you know, that the, the, the move came up and then it had to shift to what you thought you were going to be doing. Like that was kind of already always in the plan. Yeah. yeah. And actually it's kind of like one of the things I sort of regret was if I'd stayed like one more year in the States and like tried to be in bands in New York, while I was already there, that could have been like a fun experience for me. And I just was just so set on getting to Israel that uh, I didn't even think about that stuff. I was just like, let's get to Israel so we could, you know, start a band here or something, you know? So it wasn't even like, I didn't even give opportunities that I might have given a better chance, a chance, you know, in the States. Did you know what the music scene was going to be like, what the, what the music industry was going to be like once you moved there? I really didn't know. And I, I just had, you know, I had friends here and stuff. So I assumed we would start a band at some point. And that was about as far as I had thought about it. Yeah. I think we're going to get later on into like, you know, current, current ideas of success and future ideas of success about like, maybe we should probably talk about music cities and how both of us are not in music cities. Yeah. But um, yeah, like I literally didn't think about any of this stuff. I just knew I wanted to play music and I wanted to be in Israel and I had friends here that were musicians and I assumed things would happen, you know, that, but that was about as, as far as I saw it. So what was, what was the first event or the first moment that shifted your idea of success away from, you know, just being in a band and, and making music to, oh, I want to do this professionally. I want to get into the like production and mixing side of it. Yeah. So for me, when I when I moved here, uh, a bunch of my friends were actually in the Arby at the time, and I just didn't have anybody to play with, and I was just like itching to do music. Is when I sort of got into the production end of things and started recording, and bought my a handy Zoom H4n and started messing around with Logic and and stuff like that. And so that kind of was a big a big for me a big a big shift uh, in in realizing like oh there's something here that is really, that really is calling to me. And I feel like I could do all the time. And so at that point, I kind of, I don't know if I, if it changed my perception of success, but it, but I was like, I guess this is, I, that's kind of when I started making a business, so to speak. I was just like, okay, I got to start recording people and charging them. And I, that was kind of when I guess money came into the the picture of like, oh, I guess if I want to do this, I have to bring in artists to record them and I'm going to have to charge them and I have to start making money somehow. So let's try to advertise and, and put up posters and find people and stuff, you know? And so I guess at that point, my, my shift was, I want to be doing music and also recording people. And if I'm doing those things, that's good. I just, I just kind of added another layer to the, to the things that made me feel like I could be successful. <laughs> 
Hey everyone, friend of the podcast and Grammy-nominated engineer slash mixer, Travis Ferentz hosts Progressions, Success in the Music Industry. It's a podcast exploring creativity, productivity, and growth in music. Travis has set out to document his own journey and bring those valuable lessons to you to apply to your own career. Join in each week for conversations with some of the industry's best and brightest about the mindsets and strategies that they use in their careers every day. Whether you're feeling stuck, digging for inspiration, or just looking for a mix tip, Progressions is probably for you. Go check it out wherever you get your podcasts or click the link in the show notes. What about you? When did the audio thing start to become a part of your success? I would say probably the first ideas of it was prob- probably came in like 2014, 2015. Um, while I was still in cheerleader, we were still, you know, touring and doing everything. But that's when I started to experiment with production more and doing, I started by doing a bunch of remixes for friends bands, but thankfully those friends bands were like Hippocampus and the Wombats and St. Lucia and like all these, these bands that were really big in that, in that scene. Um, so I was getting to, you know, getting my hands on really great songs to mess with. And it's a lot harder to screw up a remix mm-hmm. uh, or do a bad remix when the song itself is fantastic. So that was when I started realizing, oh, I could maybe do this too. Like in addition to being a drummer, you know, whether it was if cheerleader kept going at the trajectory that we had been going at, um, if that would, if that would have kept going, then that could have been, that could have been amazing. Or if it was me just doing more, uh, you know, smaller tours for other bands or, you know, I, I think for a while, my very uh, ridiculous bar for what I thought success would be would be for me to be at the level of like Josh Fries or Keith Carlock. Mm. Like those are the people that I, I really looked up to and wanted that kind of versatility. And I, I want like that was the success was like to me, it wasn't just doing it full time. It was going to be like, OK, I want to be making music with phenomenal artists and I want to be making music with a wide variety of artists. And when I started getting deeper into the production, when it went from, you know, doing remixes for friends bands to doing it for clients, doing full productions for clients, getting really deep into into mixing and really to making that transition into focusing on just mixing, then it started to shift and it went less about having somebody else as my as a goal. You know, like comparing myself to somebody else's success was not as much of a goal. And it was more just like, oh, okay. I'm doing this full time and I'm really enjoying it and I'm working with more and more people. And I think that's when my, I think that's when my next big shift in what success meant uh, went from working full time in music or, you know, doing, you know, drumming full time, whatever it became, I want to work with as many artists as possible. And that is when things really started ramping up. And this was like maybe 2018, 2019, and then it was like, okay, I'm going to be working on 100 projects a year. And then it was like 180 projects a year. And then when 2020 hit, and it's been like 300 a year, something like that ever since. Wow. And to me, like that's that has been, for the past few years, the mark of success for me, where it's that I can find lots and lots of people that trust me and that that want to work with me and that allow me to get my hands on their on their songs. And there were always financial kind of benchmarks, you know, that I think whether we want to have them or not, no matter how like art, art, you know, artsy as we try to pretend that we are sometimes, (laughs) I think that's always a big consideration. And especially as kids come into the picture, as mortgages come into the picture, as cold brew habits come into the picture. (laughs) Love it. Uh, as furnaces start, you know, crapping out when it's, you know, 10 degrees outside, all that, that that's always been in the background. But yeah, like, as of a couple of years ago, that that definition of success kind of became more focused on, I don't want to say like, quantity over quality, because it was actually both. I was very fortunate that I knew that the more people I can work with, the better I'm going to get. And the more quality artists are going to be interested in working with me. But that worked pretty well up until recently. And I've had another shift, I think, um, Mm. 
for, for it, for my perception of success or my definition of success as, as it relates to my career, right? Not, we can get into like personal, like, you know, family yeah. success and stuff in a bit, but I just want to leave it as a little cliffhanger and switch it back to you. Yeah. To have you go like, what's, you know, the past couple of years, where has it been for you? Where's it been for me? Yeah. I mean, I, I've been through so many iterations of having a studio and also playing in bands and to, you know, right now I'm basically only in the studio, but yeah, I would say like my, my definitions of success has shifted into slowly becoming more and more audio focus. Also in terms of like the monetary stuff, in terms of like trying to like keep this business alive and sustain my family with it. So I, I would say as the years have, have progressed, uh, it's been about whittling down the things I'm doing, I guess. So like, you know, at one point it became adding more things. So I added audio to the band, to like the the songwriter and and musician guy thing. And then it became sort of like a 50-50 thing for a long time when I was doing studio stuff and also playing in a band. And we, we formed a, I formed a, co-form, uh, co-founded a wedding band and that was pretty successful and that took off. And so I'd be like going to gigs at night and then trying to get things going in the studio during the day. And I was kind of like doing both things. And that was really, that was really great for a while until, until I got married. <laughs> and that's when things sort of shifted into being like, okay, I can't like work all day and work all night, you know, yeah, <laughs> all, all the time. And so I kind of, at that point, started to think about not working as much at night and eventually made a, about in 2016, my wife and I, we, we each like, she quit her job on the same day that I just, I told the band that I was like, Hey, I'm, I don't want to manage this band anymore. So I'm happy to keep playing gigs, but I don't want to be a part of the management. It was taking up too much of my personal headspace. And then we went to Japan for a month <laughs> and just kind of like tried to figure out our lives. I remember I read a book in Japan. It was called like, um, the happiness project or the, or, or something like that, that, that was like, I was like trying to figure out like, what will make me happy? What do I, what do I really want? So I've been kind of like slowly since then sort of like whittling down how much I, I do gigs and, and trying to boost the studio stuff to sort of promote the more family geared end of my life. And then, so I guess that was kind of one definition of success is try to like do more studio stuff, spend more time with my family. And I think I've just been kind of like razor focused sort of like trying to like get that balance better and better as the years have moved on since then in that interim i ended up doing like some some cool touring and and playing with an artist named alex claire and doing things that kind of checked off some of my like rock star things that i wanted to do and uh that kind of stopped with the pandemic but it got me in, it, it got me to, like to feel at least like I had kind of sort of done the the musician stuff kind of checked off in my in my success uh, registry in my brain, and since then it's just been about kind of like how can I do work that I enjoy doing the most as often as possible, while not working all the time and having time also for my family as you know, we had kids and stuff, <laughs> and that's becoming even more and more important as the family life takes over, you know. Yeah, and continues and continues. Yeah, and continues yeah, to grow so, too. Yeah, thank God. Thankfully. Uh so yeah. How about you? <laughs> oh man. We'll, we'll go back to your cliffhanger. In my cliffhanger. Yeah. Ah oh, man. I, I went through a very similar sort of transition, I think, when I went from drumming and and like teaching drums as like the main source of income to, you know, doing doing like fifty fifty production stuff. And then it kind of went from being the drummer, being the musician, being the band guy into being in the studio and and really doing almost like the, in some ways, the exact opposite of what I used to do. And in some ways, the exact same thing I used to do. It, it op- Opposite in the sense that I used to be gigging 15, 20 times a month with all sorts of different bands. Like I was Philadelphia, you know, mercenary for, for drums. And now I'm, you know, fully remote. I work mostly from home or from my, my studio, which is like a two minute drive from here. I don't go to gigs anymore and I don't really miss it if I'm completely honest. Um, but it's very similar, if not the exact same, in the sense that I was working with a bunch of different artists constantly and, and challenging myself to fully understand not just how to play the drums, but how to really support the vision and intention of the artist and doing that with a bunch of different artists with very different intentions. And 
very similarly, that's what I do as a mixing engineer and working with so many different artists. And I think that that challenge of having to think on my feet and having to react to different artistic, musical, creative situations, that's the part that I think drew me to being the session player in the first place. And now instead of just being the drummer on it, now by being in the studio and being like the mix engineer, additional production guy, it enables me to stretch even further beyond just what you know my sticks could do. So, so, so in that sense, it was is very similar to to your story, and I think what shifted most recently for me, and this is something that I had been. It, it's not that I, it's a new feeling; it's just that I've been able to put it better into words recently. Although I just the sentence I just said really was the clunkiest way of saying it. I think that's <laughs> there's a beautiful irony in that. Um, no, but I think I've been able to better explain the feeling that I have and the goals that I have. And by by the nature of that, like that, that's also kind of helping to figure out how to define what success is. But I think before it was success meant making as much music as possible and playing with as many people as possible. And then it kind of shifted into, okay, well, I'm going to mix as many people as possible. Continue to make as much music as possible, but it's just going to be in mixing because I actually can scale up the number of people that I make music with and also you know, reach out geographically a lot more easily than as a drummer. But ultimately, what I started doing when I started coaching people with the like, branding strategy and like the outreach and all of, like the, the, the growing a studio business kind of stuff that I, I help people with. What I realized was that that's kind of like a multiplier, I think, for what I was able to do. Because before I looked at it as, oh, making music with all these people is what drives me, whether as a drummer or a mixing engineer. But then what I realized, what really drove me was when I was playing all those gigs as a drummer, it was seeing everybody move in the audience. It was making everybody have a good time. It was emotionally emotionally impacting whoever was there that night, right? So whether I was playing for 10 people or I was playing for 1,000 people, I was having uh, an emotional impact on them in that moment. Yeah. And the big difference from going from the, the you know drumming mercenary to being in the studio is that well, number one, people can listen to it more than once. And also I could potentially reach a lot more listeners. So it was the, the the idea of working with as many artists as possible wasn't just because I wanted to work with more people. It was because I wanted to emotionally impact more people. And the way to do that was just getting as many opportunities to to do that as possible. And I think that's what drew me into really helping other producers and engineers with their business. Because if I can help them, to do that, if I can help a, a producer to figure out how to express themselves in a way that they're ir irresistible to their ideal clients, and they start getting mm -hmm. better projects, and they're making more meaningful art, making more honest art, more authentic art, which is getting heard by more people because it's more genuine, then mm -hmm. I'm able to still have like a bit of like a butterfly effect impact on even more people. It's not just the mixes that I do. It's all the songs that yeah. my students can work on. And that's what drove me to do this podcast, to do my own podcast, to do all the social media stuff that I have. Because the more the more genuine connections and authentic connections I can make between producers and engineers and the artists that they work with, e even as like tiny and, and insignificant as my impact may be, if that, that little puff of air just like t sets it that's over the edge. Wing. If it, yeah, if, if it's the, you know, like the little butterfly wing like yeah that's that's fucking it man that's that's it that success is it's an, an unmeasurable success which makes it very hard to define but i think now that i've been able to understand that and realize that that was really the 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 driving force behind everything that i did that i just wasn't fully consciously aware of it now that i am conscious of it that enables me to just like really go for it because i know mm. I know why I'm doing it. I understand why I want to do the things that I do. Yeah, that's so great that you're also able to articulate that. And I, I also super resonate with that as like a bass player on stage. Whenever I get a chance to be a bass player on stage, I'm just like trying to like 
get people's uh, butts shaken, you know? Yeah. So I, I absolutely, that I, I, that's probably a big part of what I'm doing in the studio also. I haven't thought about it that deeply, but, but ju just getting to have, you know, my, my sonic sensibilities hopefully help more people enjoy art is just like so gratifying, you know, the same way that me playing bass on stage, getting people to, you know, shake their, t their, their tush uh, a little more is also deeply gratifying for me. Um, yeah. So yeah, I love that. And also I, I wanted to talk, to touch on, this has nothing to do with success or maybe it does. Uh, I don't know if it has to do with defining success, but I think there's like a, every, every person at some point has to do the numbers game to get to the quality game. And I think a lot of people go through a period of just like as much as possible. I remember interviewing DK Wydell from the Mixing Music Podcast, and he said like he like mixed a song every day for an entire year. And he was so burnt out, but it also got him, he also got really good at mixing when he did that. Yeah. He was like, this was like terrible on like every aspect of like my life, except that now I'm a really good mixer. And you know what I mean? Now, now I've put in those, those out, those reps and those hours. And so I think at some point in your life, you're going to do that, like, you know, the dirty work and just like go hard, but th that'll hopefully give you the tools you need for further down in your career when you need more space for say your family or just, uh, you know, your aging body. <laughs> to continue on this, this little side path, I think, I feel very lucky that my first year of like really mixing a crap load of songs was 2020 because of the fact that I had to mix a lot of poorly recorded like home studio vocals. I, I feel like if I did, you know, 318 mix, whatever, I forget what the number was, like 318 songs that year where everything was recorded well in a studio, I would not be nearly as good or as confident as I am now because all of the hard stuff would have been kind of done before I got my hands on it. And I feel like that the resistance training of, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like uh, sprinting with ankle weights, <laughs> you know, when, when you have to deal with songs that the, all the, the, the elite, the verses were recorded on an SM7, but then they broke it. So they did the choruses on like their USB mic or something, or, you know, like what, whatever weird stuff that, uh, gets thrown at you like when you just tackle it head on and put those reps in it's magical yeah i love that when i when at some point in my journey i i sort of decided my my niche is going to be i'm going to be the mobile recording guy and i built like a big box and a la you know had a laptop and i was going to take it to different places to record people and i did that and it was it was terrible for my back but it was really great to get a bunch of recordings in different kinds of spaces that were not necessarily ideal because it really taught me about, you know, finding resonant frequencies, how to make something sound good, even if there are some things in it that are bad. I think it just like gave me a whole tool set of dealing with crappy audio that I'm using every day <laughs> in my life. And I think what's interesting too, is that at the time you probably did not think that it was going to have an effect on the yeah. future in the sense that now you, you know, you have a podcast production business and I'm sure not everything that you're sent is recorded well in a great room. Post, post production business. Post production. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing. Yeah. So you're, you, you have a lot of practice problem solving and yes. I'm sure you came into doing this much, much more, I don't want to say like quickly and easily because it's still going to be a pain in the ass <laughs> a lot of times, but I feel like it, you came, you came into it much more prepared with, you know, better, better problem solving skills, even though it seems yeah. kind of unrelated or it wasn't, it sure wasn't the plan. Yeah, sure. wasn't the plan, but, uh, but yeah, we did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so job. what does success look like right now for you? I don't think we got to that. Well, you sort of, I guess you kind of answered the question, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what does, what does success look like for me? I think success for me is working on music that I find meaningful, not working on things that I don't resonate with. So a lot more yes and a lot a lot more no also at the same time and hopefully earning enough to sustain my family and and at this point like only doing music is not what's happening because I do also have this post production business but it's enabled me to sort of be a lot pickier about what I choose to work on with music cuz now I have less time but it's I has to I have to make it count a bit more yeah so I'm able I I've never been happier with the productions I'm working on now and I think for me, success is for for this stage of my life is going to continue to be sort of that whittle down of like 
just hopefully working on better and more better projects that I resonate with more and I'm 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 the right fit for less of things that I I don't really resonate with or you know don't need to take on and just kind of hopefully earning enough to support my family that's kind of where I'm at to touch on like the music th- city thing which I I, I feel like we should touch on like that. Why are neither of us in, you know, Nashville or LA or, or whatever. And it's just cause I have other priorities also, you know what I mean? And like, if my only priority was success in the music business in terms of like just working on like, I don't know whether it's label projects or bigger artists, whatever it is, bigger budgets, then LA is probably where you want to be for that stuff. But that would entail a lot of things that I don't want to do, such as moving my family to LA moving further away from other the rest of my family, my extended family, my wife's extended family, living uh, what I would probably say is a less, uh, how do I say this nicely? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like LA is like a, a little bit more of a plasticky sort of a, a vibe, whereas things things here are very real and grounded and feel grounded to the earth. People are very real and at least in my, in my neighborhood, in my community here in Israel. So those are things that I, that are also important and priorities to me as well. So for me, success is still having all those things, still having my my family and my wife's family nearby while working on as much meaningful music as possible simultaneously. So I guess that would sort of be my definition of success. How about you? Yeah, yeah. I think, well, I'll, I'll say what I think is really amazing about the fact that we are doing what we do when we're doing it is the fact that it's 2024 and the foundational necessity of living in a big music city is just not what it was. Is it easier? Probably in some respects, you know, is it easier to meet people and be in person with people? Yeah, of course. But when the cost of living is, I don't know, three or four times more than what it is here (laughs) where I am, uh, you know, it it gives me flexibility in other ways. And I, if, if I wanted to do what I'm doing now 20 years ago, it just was would not have been a thing, right? Like I could not have been a remote mixing engineer in 2004, no. right? You know, that's not... No. I, yeah, that, that could... Definitely not, not in Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, in Amish country. Like, yeah, it's... I, I always say, man, it's so, it's so fun that I am so digitally connected to the artists that I work with and I'm very fascinated by artificial intelligence and like use it every day. But yet I literally live in Amish country. So it's like, I have to, you know, go around horse and buggies while I'm listening to podcasts <laughs> about, you know, AI. whatever AI and stuff. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I, I love the, the juxtaposition. And and I think, do you feel like it, do you feel like it keeps you grounded? I, I, yeah. You know, and, and I think, especially because I live in that, in the Amish area, that the, the change does not happen, right? So even though when I was a little kid, we'd go camping out in, in this area and things just haven't changed, you know? So I think it does keep me grounded in the sense that it's not just that my job is taking me faster into, you know, progression and the you know, the future faster than the area around me. It's like, oh no, like it, there a lot of this area is very firmly stuck in, I don't know, 1800s, <laughs> I <Yeah>. guess, you know? <laughs> Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I love that, that juxtaposition, that dichotomy, you know, that's, it's fascinating to me. And I do think it keeps me grounded. And that's something that I love. I get way too anxious when I'm in New York. I get way too anxious when I'm in LA. I I maybe could survive in a music city if I didn't have other things that I love, but it seems like I kind of have the best of both worlds. I'm kind of having my cake and eating it too. Amazing. Well, I'm glad to hear that on your behalf. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, I feel like if I was, you know, starting over and I was 23 again or 24, at 23 and 24, I didn't have the the brain that I have now and I haven't gone through the experiences that I have now, but but and I couldn't have done anything any differently looking back on my on my journey, but if I was a 36-year-old Ben brain in a 23-year-old Ben body, then maybe I would have spent some time either in LA or, or somewhere else to sort of try to like make connections and build myself up while I was young. So I don't, I don't necessarily know, think that going to a music city is a bad idea, but at this stage in my life with the, the responsibilities I've taken upon myself and, and the, the community that I'm a part of and the people that I want to be a part of, it's just not, that's not what I would, 
for me, that would no longer be successful. But yeah. maybe 23-year-old Ben, looking back, it could have been a good idea, but it didn't happen. So what are you going to do about it? Yeah. And it wouldn't have led you to where you are now. Right. And uh, yeah, also like, are we happy with what we're doing? Like, I think we're both happy with the work we're doing, the lives we're living and, you know, you know, doing all number one, you know, label work, I don't think would make me happier. It would probably make me more anxious. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think we as humans, and I think especially we as creatives, we can either be really great at adapting to the situations that we're in and making the most of it, or we can be really, really terrible at it. And I feel like I'm very thankful that both you and I are pretty good at it. And I think, right. you know, I, right. Do you agree with that? I think I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I'm, or at least, at least you're good at it. At least you're I'm good. trying, you know, and at least you're trying. And we're trying to, I guess we're both trying to make the best of our lives and we're both happy with the lot we were, we were dealt. So I guess that's a, that's a, that's a big part of success also, you know? Well, do you think that's maybe why our vision of success changes? Like our, as our own lives and priorities and passions change, so too will the the definitions of success that we have, right? But yes, do you think that if we weren't as flexible with the situations that we get into and how we do things, like if we were like, oh no, this is the one way things have to be, do you think that we would still have the same success definition that we had when we were in high school or college? Yeah. And would we be miserable and jaded or would be, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this question. I guess it's just more of a rhetorical existential kind of thing. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, if we had had different goals, maybe when we were younger, then we might've gone in a different direction and would have chosen a different definition of success. So maybe it's a chicken or egg situation because of whatever goals we had at the beginning of our careers led us down these paths to be where we are now. And we want to be happy with the lot we were given and the lives we're living. At the, at the same time, we we constantly are adapting and we're constantly refining. And so I, I think we would probably have different definitions of success if we had gone a more, you know, balls to the wall, let's go to LA and just like work all the time sort of mentality when we were in our 20s. But maybe we would realize, oh, I should have been more judicious. I don't, I don't, there's no way to know, right? Yeah. Well, I think that the only difference between being determined and being stubborn is just whether or not it works out in your favor. Mm. You know? So, like, if you went to LA when you're 23 and you just like, we're like going for it, you're like, I'm going to do this. If it ended up working out, damn, Ben was determined, you know? But if you went there and it wasn't working and you weren't happy and you, refused to adapt and kept going after this air quotes dream that you had, even if it wasn't working and even if, it, even if it was working, but it wasn't making you happy, then you just be stubborn Ben, you know, refusing to, to change. Yeah. And I'd rather be, you know, adaptable, happy Carl, you know, happy with, <laughs> you know, not just where I'm at, but where I'm going and finding joy in not knowing where we're going to end up. Basically, it's like, you know, knowing we're never going to be successful in the sense, you know what I mean? Like in, in the sense that we're always going to, it's always going to change. You know, like as soon as we get there, change There's always sight. another, there's always another mountaintop once you get always, to one peak. Always, always. And I think that's why, you know, defining success is kind of a goofy thing to do in the first place. Even mm. though I know we just spent, this entire episode talking about it. But I mean, like, <laughs> defining success and believing that it is a finite goal. Yeah. That's that's dangerous. And I feel like a lot of people, especially it's in the a music limiting industry. Belief. Yeah. I think a lot of people in the industry, or that want to be in the industry, kind of have that, that sense. And they have a, an idea of what it's going to mean to be a successful producer, to be a successful engineer, a successful session player. But a lot of times it leads to disappointment or a total change in what you actually perceive that to be. Yeah. I guess uh, if we're looking to the future, you know, I guess that would be like the last stage of in our journeys of success or defining success. Do you, do you foresee any, any changes in the future for you of like how you may define success or? Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. I, I, I've, I do feel like I tend to adapt what success means to me like every day, like every day gets a little bit different, but I think it's because it's, it's always the horizon, right? We're never going to get closer to it. 
we're always going to be the same distance from the horizon. The horizon itself just changes shape. Right. Yeah. I find joy in that. I don't know. I find comfort in that in a weird way. And I find a lot of excitement in that. I, I love and I'm thankful for how many weird twists and turns and unexpected things happened so far to me in my life. You know, some great, some not so great, you know, but I look forward to the surprises around the corner. And I think because of that, maybe if I had to pick one definition of success that I had to stick with, it would just be, you know, the, the constant movement toward a, a newfound perspective of what being happy means. Love that. I feel the same way. I feel like we don't know where this journey is going to take us from here on out, you know? Yeah. In a, in a year from now, we might be in completely different worlds, you know what I mean? But if we're open-minded and excited about potential prospects that who knows what will will happen, we'll be able to embrace those changes and and hopefully try to be happier or or do things that help us stay happy. Because I think happiness is, at the end of the day, the, the, the goal. And uh, music makes me happy. So that's why I keep doing music. Helping other people make music it makes me happy. So I keep helping other people make music. Having a little bit of a work-life balance and having time with my kids makes me happy. So I keep doing that also. So I, f I feel like those kind of ground rules are going to continue to affect our choices of what we do, what we don't do, and how we define that success for ourselves. To put a ribbon on it. I think we're, I think we're on very similar pages, me and you and Carl. Yeah, I, th I think so too. And I'd say the only thing you forgot to mention is how happy it makes you to see me when we record oh, these episodes. That's part, I mean, that's part of it. And that's one of the, you know what? And that's one of the twists that like, I did not see my, me having a co-host for the show a year ago. And then I got to a point where it's like, I'm not gonna be able to do the show if I don't have a co-host. And then I get to do it with you. And that gives me joy. And that Aww. also opens up so many possibilities of where the show might go. And and that's really exciting. And I'm super pumped and excited about all that stuff. So, yay. <laughs> hey, well, thank you kindly for taking the bait on that one. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> Bye, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Ben. We hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. If anything here resonated with you, please share this or your favorite episode with a friend. And as always, we love to hear from our listeners. So find us on social media at Secret Sonics, at Ben Wallach Music, and at Carl Bonner. Until next time, bye, Ben. Bye, Carl. <laughs> that was good. I think yeah. the outro was great. <laughs>